Right. Um, so while I've been preparing for this talk, I've done a couple of blog posts. I've actually set up a, a pattern library called darkpatterns.org, and I've been talking to quite a lot of people about it while I've been writing it. And um, quite a few people have asked, you know, why are you actually doing this? You're act in fact making a guidebook for evil designers. You're making it very easy for them to go along to that site and basically copy all of the tricks that you've described there. Um, so actually, the answer to that is quite simple. Um, the reason I've done it is because all kinds of con artistry um, rely on the hustler having knowledge that the victim doesn't have. They have to know about the trick, and the, the, the victim can't know about it or it won't work. So as soon as that knowledge is shared, then they've got no tricks they can pull, right? Um, scams don't work if the victim knows what the hustler's trying to do. Um, so that's the kind of one of the main driving reasons why I've been built up a lot of interest in this. Um, and one of the questions I want to sort of try to tackle in this talk today is the question of why we lose good designers to the dark side. Because if you think about it, there are actually a number of, um, well, quite a number of big brands who are using dark patterns, like dirty tricks to increase their conversion rates, which means they must have people like us working for them, doing the design, running the A-B testing, running the user research, and iterating on it. So, I mean, that kind of perplexes me. That, that that's, How does that happen? And that's one of the questions I want to kind of think about. Um, in doing so, I'd like you to join me in a game of let's pretend. It's a thought experiment, so don't worry, you don't actually have to do anything. Um, so let's pretend you're head of design at a fictitious low-cost airline, and it's your first day at this new job, okay? So you're in charge of all of the UI design, you're in charge of all the analytics, um, metrics, and all that sort of thing, okay? Um, so you go into work on your first day, and you meet your new boss. <laughs> <laughs> and he says to you, let's talk about sources of revenue. And he goes on to explain in a very patronizing manner that um, basically only a fraction of your revenue is made from ticket price shown there in green. Uh, most money is made through all the other stuff, like charging people to check in their bags, charging them quite a lot of money for a bottle of water and food on the airplane, charging them for priority boarding. That's where most of the money is, right? So the first task he gives you is to achieve an uplift in insurance purchases. And this is the insurance purchase page on your, uh, the fictitious airline that you work at. Okay, so, um, yeah, he goes on to explain to you that actually there's a few cash flow problems at the moment, and in fact, really, really relying on this uplift. So, you know, if you can't make this work, then there's going to be probably be redundancies for people in your team, possibly even you. So the pressure's on. I mean, it's your first day, and they're already messing with you like this. It's kind of it's pretty heavy. Um, so just to describe this page a bit, I don't know, can you actually read that? It looked great on my monitor at work, but it's kind of a, bit, <laughs> a bit blurry here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is your typical insurance upsell page. But, so the consumers pick their flights and they want to check out. And it, the site's just saying, hey, wait a minute, before you check out, do you want to buy insurance? And on this page, the user has to explicitly say yes or no before they can proceed on to the next page. Neither is pre-selected as a default. So um, the recipe, the kind of mix that we've got going on so far, right, we've got this kind of aggressive, high-pressure working environment. Um, and we've also got a really big blinkered emphasis on metrics. You've been asked to focus on this one thing and this one thing only in your, in your job in the next few weeks, right? Um, so you go off and you do a bit of reading. You're still on your first day in your new job, right? So you go and look in the box of books you've brought with you to work and you read about persuasive technology and the psychology of persuasion and stuff on behavioral economics, which is all really interesting, but it's a bit theoretical. It's not telling you how to actually redesign that page, which is what you need, right? So you, instead, you decide to go off and look for some real-world examples. How do other businesses persuade consumers to do stuff? Um, so this is the first example you stumble upon. It's quite well known, this example. It's kind of been all over the web recently. The uh, NHS or organ donor registers around the world, basically. Here in the UK, um, you have to sign up to the register to say you want to be an organ donor, so it's opt-in. But in other countries, it works the other way around. They assume that everyone in the country is an organ donor, and you sign up to say you don't want to be one. Um, so there's quite an interesting piece of research by um, Johnson and Goldstein, you can see here, uh, in a paper called Do Defaults Save Lives? Um, so on the left there, the kind of gold area, um, they're the um, opt-in countries, like the UK. And on the right, there's the opt-out countries like um, Belgium, France, Hungary, and so on. You can see there's a big difference in the graph there. So it's the kind of getting up off your ass off the sofa to go and register works both ways. And in the case of the, opt -out, in the, case of the blue opt-out countries, um, that's really good news if you need um, 
if you need organs donated to you. So, um, I mean, what we're looking at here isn't exactly the same as your insurance upsell problem, right? But it does indicate that defaults can have a really big impact on human behavior. And in fact, that, that difference there is statistically significant. 16.3 uh, increase in organ donation when you switch the default to opt out, right? So this kind of gets you thinking. Um, this is the Oxfam.com donation page. Um, and uh, so you come along here when you want to make a donation. You fill in that small form there in the middle in the green. Um, so you might put £10 there. And oh, actually, if you have a look closely, you'll see regular monthly donation is selected as pre-selected when the page loads. Okay, so I expect the designers of this page would argue that they're simply trying to encourage people to do something. Uh, it's a form of persuasion. Um, you know, look at this. This is the option we recommend. This is, this is what most people do. You should do it too. Or they might say, well, since most people are selecting it, we're actually making it easier because there's one less click involved. So, you know, it's easier for all those people. Um, but, I mean, is it? Because on the other hand, there could be quite a few people coming through here are putting £10 in, meaning to do a single donation, not realising, and then clicking next. So end up setting up a monthly payment on via direct debit. So is it ethical? Um, in my opinion, actually, I think this, this example is ethical because, I mean, look at the form. It's quite, it's quite small. There's not much going on there. They're not trying to hide the options. So although they're pushing things a bit by pre-selecting one of the options, it seems okay, doesn't it? I mean, it's for Oxfam as well, which is, for the, which is for the greater good. So that seems okay. What about another example? Why don't we take that same design pattern and look at it on another site? This is comet.co.uk. This is the page you get to if you try and buy an iPad. Um, so you go along, you put an iPad in your basket, then you go to try and check out. And look, below, suddenly something's appeared there that you haven't put in. You've got an iPad case there. Um, 30 quid that's just appeared out of nowhere. Now, um, what they're doing is they're arguing that it's, it's, they're, they're doing it in your interest. It's to protect your iPad from bumps and scratching, which is a nice idea, but if they really cared, they'd put it in there for free. Um, <laughs> <coughs> well, I mean, well, I mean it's, it's, it's the same design pattern that we looked at before, but in this case, it's clearly quite naughty. Um, so is this ethical? I'd argue not at all. It's actually very sneaky. They're putting something into your basket without asking your permission. They're sneaking it in there. Um, so these kind of design patterns, I mean, probably most kinds of dark patterns um, focus on two, two sort of slices of the pie. So of the people who pass through that page, a certain percentage will firstly simply not notice what's happened and make the purchase anyway and never be any wiser. They might unpack the stuff and then think it just came with it and never look at the receipt and realize they've been charged more. And then there'll be another percentage who do notice after completing the purchase, but by that time, they're too busy to do anything about it or too, sorry, they, they might be too lazy or simply too busy at that point. So they kind of, um, you can imagine unpacking a new iPad, looking at the case that's come with it, then realizing how much that, that it's cost you 30 quid more. So do you then repackage it all and send it back, or do you say, oh, is it really worth the effort? You have to weigh up your effort versus the time. And so dark pattern designers take advantage of these two slices of the pie. And admittedly, they're not big slices, but there's money in them. So um, that's what it's all about. Let's look at a different example now. Let's look at the page you get to um, from, if you visit the Wired Magazine website in the UK and you want to set up um, payment for, uh, for having it posted to your home, this is the page you get to, so if you want a year's worth of subscription. Uh, so it's a fairly standard, boring looking form. You've got to fill in your address and so on. And at the bottom, there's the marketing options. Now, um, let's not forget the marketing options have a cash value with them. You know, if you opt into third party um, marketing, then they will just sell your details on, right? So what does Condé Nast do to try and get as many people as possible to sign up? Well, it's a bit like a, a bit like, a, if you want to opt out, it's a bit like a dance. You have to go skip, skip, tick, tick, skip, skip, tick, tick. Um, and if you obviously, if you get a foot wrong on any of those, you'll end up opting into something. Um, and if it's um, third party sort of by phone or by post, there might be a number of companies who you have to then tell to stop doing it. It's a load of hassle, right? So it's probably likely that they've actually A-B tested this area and they've found out that this is the design that works the best. It delivers the best conversion rates because the most people um, end up opting in. Well, it's no surprise. It's, it's downright trickery when you look at it like that, isn't it? Okay, so let's look at another example. This example really uh, takes the biscuit, actually. Um, the Evil Genius Award goes to 
Ryanair. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if it surprises some of you, but um, let's look at this example. This is the uh, insurance upsell page that Ryanair have. Um, so um, at the top of the page there, it says passenger, passenger details, that first box there at the top, okay? Um, now, we all know that people, when they're on the web, they normally scan read. They don't read every single word on every single page. And the design of this, this, this area here really takes advantage of that fact in a very nefarious way, okay? So firstly, there's the section title, which is passenger details. That, that sounds quite innocuous, doesn't it? It sounds like where you just fill in the details for your ticket. And if you get it wrong, they might not even let you get on the plane. So you want to fill it in right. Um, but actually, it's the upsell area. So let's zoom in and have a better look at that. So uh, a certain number of users are going to fill it in and then skip over all of the blurb and then just end up looking at that drop-down box there on the bottom right, which says, please select country of residence. Now, that sounds like an innocuous question, doesn't it? It's where you're from. But if you select your country of residence, you end up buying travel insurance. Um, and in fact, if you don't want travel insurance, you have to open up the drop-down and then pick no travel insurance required, which is sandwiched between <laughs> Latvia and Lithuania for some reason. It's not even alphabetical. It makes no sense at all. Why would it, why would it appear there? Um, so, I mean, what's, what's really clever about this is in the other examples we looked at, um, the opt-in had been defaulted. So um, you could see on the page what they were trying to do. But in this case, they're actually tricking the user to put it in their basket themselves. So probably from a legal point of view, they might be slightly better off, although obviously I'm not a lawyer, but kind of quite clever there. Um, so no travel insurance required. What happens if you don't fill in that drop-down box at all? Let's have a look. So if you skip it and you get to an error condition and you try and submit the form, it'll say, instead of highlighting buy extra travel insurance or highlighting the text below, all they do is highlight just this box here. Right, because they want as many people as possible to focus in on just that question because it sounds innocuous and they'll end up buying stuff that they didn't mean to. So it's very clever. Um, okay, so let's remember it's the, your first day in your new job, okay, and it comes to the end of the day and you're feeling a bit depressed and a bit mixed up and confused, right? So you go to the supermarket to buy some junk food and some beers and stuff and you start to think about, um, you know, what would opt out upsells be like if they were in the real world? And uh, thinking about it, they're actually the digital equivalent of a supermarket manager putting something in your trolley when you're not looking. So you'd be there sort of getting your milk and he'd run up behind you with an organic chicken and slip it into the trolley and run off <laughs> before you turned around again. And you can imagine the argument would be, oh, well, I didn't force you to buy anything, sir. I was just merely recommending that you bought it. And you can take that out of your trolley any time. You know, I saw you were buying sage and onion. I thought this would go together well. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it's, you can, when, when you think about it in a real-world met metaphor, it's kind of obviously a scam. And the reality of it is, is that the reason why you would do something like that is to trick people into buying it, right? People won't notice, and they'll end up making purchases. Um, so what's, what's amazing is just the sheer number of brands um, that are doing this kind of thing. This, this is a list of some of the brands that are named on darkpatterns.org at the moment. And you can see there's some big names there. You've got Hotels.com, Nike, Orbitz, Facebook... Well, Facebook's kind of obvious, but... Um, so the fact is, all these big brands are giving small up-and-coming brands, businesses, the green light. They're basically saying, if you want to be big and successful like us, this is how you have to do it. Um, this is the normal right way of doing things. So out of our recipes so far, remember, we've got the aggressive environment and the huge emphasis on metrics. Um, we've also now got social proof. So the design of the going with the herd and seeing what... Uh, all the other bigger brands are doing. And that kind of interests me, that particular one, because I think we can, we can use that to our advantage um, to sort of stop these sort of practices happening. Okay, so let's just say for the sake of argument that you give in to your dark side for the purpose of our thought experiment, okay? So you go ahead and you change the insurance default to opt out on that page. And insurance purchase rates double overnight, which is, sounds great. You know, you saved your job and the job the people in your team, you think, wow, and all within the first few days of my new job, great. And you go and see your new boss, but instead of a smile, you see a familiar frown. Um, <clears throat> uh, and actually, he explains to you that even though uh, the sales have gone up, now the call center's <laughs> overwhelmed with cancellation calls, and you have to go off and fix it. So as you leave that meeting, you realize that undo is the enemy of a dark pattern designer, right? An effective dark pattern has to make it very easy 
uh, for a user to get into a situa situation and then it has to make it very hard for them to get out of it. So easy in, difficult out. It has to be, it has to have that sort of dynamic, otherwise a dark pattern can't work. Easy in, difficult out. Easy in, difficult out. <laughs> um, <laughs> but let's have a look, look at what LA Fitness do when they're using this, this sort of formula. So if you want to sign up to LA Fitness in the States, um, you can go on their website. It's very, very polished, and you can sign up and pay by credit card and become a member that way. And you can imagine they probably spent money on usability testing, got real users into a lab and spent thousands um, trying to perfect that because they want as many people who start that process to finish it. Um, there's a huge amount of cash value in that, right? But if you want to then cancel your membership, well, if you dig around on the site, you'll find the opposite sort of process is true. You, have to, you actually uh, have to send a cancellation letter to a specific address. You can't send it to your local gym. You have to send it to a specific central address. Um, so you can see they're trying to make it as hard as possible for you to get out, right? Because they'll therefore have more members and therefore make more money. Um, so you could su sort of suspect, oh, it's, it's a legacy system. It's like some legal processes require paper, right? But, I mean, not in this day and age. If you see anything that requires you to switch modes to telephone or to, um, or to post, someone's designed it like that to stop you from doing something or to at least to discourage you as much as they can within the scope of the law. Um, okay, let's look at orbits.com. This is a bit more relevant to your, uh, your low-cost airline that you work up, right, because they do um, travel. So going on to orbits.com and buying a ticket is very easy, right? You can uh, you go on there, you search for flights, find your tickets, then you can make the purchase, and the whole thing will take about five minutes. Um, if you then realize you bought your insurance by mistake, let's see how they design the process on the way out. So the same level of care and understanding of human psychology goes into both Design, the designing both of these sort of layers, right? So getting out, well, you'll find a 24-hour call center number on the website, and that seems good. 24 hours sounds like it's going to be good customer service, right? Um, you make the call, and then you'll find out that actually you can't... You'll find out that actually you have to call the insurance company in order to um, do the cancellation. And the thing is, they're only Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. Now, that's actually very clever, because that means some people will try and call on the weekend or in the evening, and that in involves a big delay, a delay of a few days or at least a night, right? So and that, by having that delay, some people are just going to forget or give up, which is great news. Less cancellation equals more money. Um, so ultimately, if you get through that big hurdle, you can call, in, call the insurance company and cancel it. But then we're looking at you know, up to two days versus five minutes. And kind of think about the difference in that scale. It's huge. There's no mistakes going on there. They've done that very carefully and, and on purpose. So let's go back to our recipe so far. Um, we have got the aggressive, high-pressure working environment. We've got a really big blinkered emphasis on metrics, the social proof. And you can see there's an empty box there, so there's a fourth item I want to talk to you about. And I'd actually like to phrase this one as a question, OK? Why is it that in SEO, they've always recognized the difference between black hat and white hat practices, but in UI design, people don't really talk about it. I mean, there's me. I talk about black hat stuff, and I've only been doing it, talking about it for the last few months. There's maybe one or two other people in the States who go on about it, but that's out of an industry of thousands and thousands of people. Why don't we differentiate in the same way that SEO people do? And they've been doing it right since the dawn of search engines. They've known about the difference. Um, so I have a theory, and I'm going to tell you about it. Um, my theory about this is that with, um, with SEO... Google, the Google bot can pass the source code of every site on the, on the web, yeah? So SEO is implemented at a source code level, um, so, and the Google bot can, can detect it. But, um, so it's passable, right? With UI design, on the other hand, um, you implement the UI design you know, at a source code level, but it occurs at the level of human psychology, uh, which is like a whole level above. And bots can't work like that at the moment. Maybe in 50 or 100 years, we'll have bots that can mimic human cognitive fallacies. But right now, we, that doesn't happen. So we can't detect um, black hat UIs automatically in the way we can de detect um, black hat SEO. So in the, ca in the case of SEO, well, the reason why they've got that big line between the two is they get detected very easily and they get punished. In terms of black hat UI design, well, no one's really going to catch you very quickly and you won't get penalized very hard either. So you might as well do it in some respects, you know. Instead of being black and white, it's just shades of grey all the way down in UI design. 
Um, so there you have it. You have a recipe of an aggressive working environment, a big emphasis on metrics, social proof, and the fact that black hat UIs can't be passed. Okay, so that's kind of, I think, the formula that's making it happen. And I'd really like to ask you guys, I mean, what is there, 270 people from the industry in the room today? Um, if we put our minds together, we can set it right. Um, the initial effort I've made is to just set up darkpatterns.org, which is you know, a, yeah, a small initial effort. So I've got about a dozen or so different design patterns on there, of which we talked about two or three of them today. Um, but, I mean, that's, that's just an initial step, right? What we need to do is something much bigger and involving all of us. I think we need a code of ethics. Um, it doesn't have to be a, big, be a big, heavy, complicated thing like that. Um, you know, just a simple but clear set of patterns that we are and aren't allowed to use, okay? So I looked on, while I was doing my research, looked on the IXDA website. They don't have a code of ethics on there. And on the UPA site, well, they have a code of ethics, but it's kind of vague. And with kind of vagueness like that, it's very easy to kind of argue, argue your way around something and just kind of think of yourself as being ethical when you're not. We need something that's a lot more specific. The other thing that I think will be fun to do will be to publicly humiliate all the big brands that are currently using dark patterns on a regular basis to improve their conversion rates. Let's name and shame them, and let's write to them and say, why are you still doing this? Because if... I mean, at the moment, you can kind of get away with it without having a big negative impact on your brand. But as an industry, if we start frowning on that, then they will shy away from it because they don't like their brands to be damaged, right? And let's embarrass them into giving up. So I'm kind of coming to the end of my talk now. I've kind of gone through it at quite a pace, actually. So I'll have time for some questions in a minute. But, I mean, this is the situation that I want us to be in. I want to have a situation where new, young, up-and-coming designers will have ammunition to respond to their bosses when they're asked to do unethical work. They can, I want them to be able to say things like, actually, boss, that design pattern you're asking me to do is forbidden by the professional association that I'm a member of. Or that, you know, if we do it, we'll get named and shamed and publicly humiliated, which is not good for our brand. I want people to be able to say no easily, and we have to help them to do that. Um, so for this to happen, we all have to join in. And if, if you're not helping, in a way, you're actually part of the problem. So thanks very much. Um, yeah, that's my talk. So, cheers. <laughs> Has anyone got any questions? No? It was completely self-contained and clear? <laughs> I thought so. Um, I think if you wanted to become a dark pattern designer, go and have a look on the Wikipedia article about human cognitive fallacies, yeah. or any, any of those, uh, um, Cal Caldini's book on weapons of persuasion, and you can, oh, pretty much any usability principle there is, you can just invert and use for evil purpose to stop people from doing something rather than to try and get them to do something. Um, yeah, that'll be my next book. <laughs> so um, some of that might have just been incompetence rather than evil design, are you uh, distinguishing between the two? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean that's why I talk, I've been talking about dark patterns. As a per An anti-pattern, I think, is, some, is basically bad, bad design in terms of mistakes or schoolboy errors. Um, but what's interesting is if, if someone implements something by mistake and they find their company is getting great conversion rates off it, who is then going to go in there and go, oh, unmistake that and reduce the conversion rate? You'd have to have a lot of guts to make that happen. Um, so some, I think sometimes it happens by mistake, but then people don't go and get rid of it because they don't want to break the revenue they're generating. I mean, yeah, of course, there always will be cases where things are simply just mistakes. So I don't think any of the examples I've used here, though, were mistakes. I think they all look, I mean, they're all very recent examples. They all look quite, quite carefully crafted as well. But yeah. Is there a grey line? Is there a, it's uh, shades of grey all the way down, <laughs> um, I think, with the UI design. I think. It's, it's always arguable, like with the Oxfam thing, it seemed okay, but it was actually exactly the same pattern as the Comet, more or less. So you have to kind of weigh these up on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, that was exactly my question. I mean, it's, um, you know, where does a dark pattern start and persuasive where design, does persuasive yeah. design, a gentle nudge, a something that helps me, that facilitates a decision-making process, 
end. I mean, you know, it's an Amazon checkout, a dark pattern, because well from a certain point, I can't remove anything from my basket. I think, I personally think that we should never put something into someone's checkout without, without the, and people, sh the checkout should be a sort of, sort of their basket, I mean, should be a sacred area. I don't think anything should ever get put in there unless the user does it explicitly themselves. So I think that could be an example of a very clear-cut example of a practice we should sort of ban, basically. Because it's funny, because more and more people are doing it at the moment because it delivers the great conversion rates, and that's what people need and businesses need right now. So, yeah, we all need to speak up and do something about this. It's terrible. <laughs> Hi, Harry. Um, do you think it has anything to do with the background of the people that have implemented these designs? I, I say that because it occurs to me that a lot of user experience people come from the motivation of really wanting to help people, and I wonder if there's a slightly different pressure and perhaps a different field yeah, in um, the background. I think, well, I've on the Dark Pattern site, I've had a couple of people kind of trolling on there saying that they thought it was all nonsense, but, and I kind of spoke to them by email, and it's mainly people who are used to being in a big, big organizations and getting their designs dictated to by marketing, um, basically. So you'll often get designers who just implement, implement the stuff that they're told to by someone else in a different department. And I think that's where the problem can happen. I mean, it's all about when you focus in on just the conversion rates and not the effect on your customers' minds, basically. That's when problems occur. Hi there. Um, I guess as long as um, companies still continue to make money from this, they're going to carry on doing it, right? Well, yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's profitable and it's effective. So I guess we, we have to try and, like you, like you mentioned, we have to try and make sure that it becomes uh, n not uh, successful for them by exposing them, right? So how, yeah. how can we possibly do that, though, as a group of specialist professionals? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, well, yeah, I was thinking about when I was making the slides, it's like, this is the list of companies I'm never going to be able to work for again. <laughs> 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 so, so I picked them quite carefully. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is tricky. You can always submit stuff anonymously, <laughs> and I'll put it on. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, at the moment, I'm using darkpatterns.org to collate together a pattern library, and I think that might be a good first step. But having a bit more officialness about it, like uh, having a code of ethics that's on the UPA site and that has a big, like a professional association that has a big membership to, I think that could be a good step. Yeah, but I mean, a, a code of ethics isn't going to shame the companies or give them enough bad publicity to warrant it not yeah. being worth it anymore. Yeah, true, but I mean, it's a step, isn't it? Um, sure. I think naming and shaming them on, on, on the web, I think it's quite fun looking at what other people do and pointing the finger at them. And it almost so needs like an internet version of Watchdog. Yeah, well, like if, <laughs> if anyone wants to set that up, I'll be the presenter <laughs> if you want, because I've always oh wanted to do on Watchdog. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to start the public humiliation, actually. Uh, Carphone Warehouse I worked for last year, who do the insurance opt-out. They asked me to look at the problem which you described, which was that having put the uh, insurance in the basket, they were getting a lot of call center cancellation calls. So the next step to was to reduce call center costs. So they wanted to put their call center script on the web so that users, instead of phoning up, then had to go through the opt-out process themselves. And this was a 22-screen process. <laughs> <laughs> I pointed out that nobody was going to get to the end of this process, to which they were delighted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I think, I, I, some, oh, in reference to what Seb was saying, I do wonder if this is going to be a bit like um, the, the accessibility issue, which, begin, which began as a kind of um, ethical or moral question, and mm. then became almost inadvertently, a business question once accessible sites became more usable on different devices.